All right, well, welcome. Um, we are so excited that you have all joined us tonight for the kickoff of our series, A Celebration of Jewish, Latin, and Ladino Life in Greater New Haven. This series is brought to you by PJ Library and the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven Center for Jewish Life and Learning. My name is Kayla Bisbee, and I am the Family Outreach Coordinator for the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven. So that means I manage our local PJ Library group, Shalom Baby, um, and our Facebook group. Uh, the link is in the chat box. If you are not part of that group, please join it. There's a lot of great discussion there. And if you feel comfortable again, please take a moment to introduce yourselves and share where you are joining us from tonight in the chat box. So I'm also happy to share that I am joined by our Center for Jewish Life and Learning um, Director, Rabbi Josh Pernick, as well as our Federation Marketing Manager, Derek Holodak, who is managing our tech needs. So thank you both for your help, as well as a very special guest, Amy Holt, who is our interim CEO and our always uh, Chief Development Officer. So thank you, Amy, for joining us. Um, so quickly, before I introduce our esteemed guest who is here on the screen with me, I want to make sure that all of the Jewish kiddos in your life from newborn to age eight are signed up for PJ Library. And the tweens in your life from age eight and a half to 12 are signed up for PJ Our Way. And make sure that you encourage your friends and family to subscribe for books as well. They are free. And Susan, thank you um, for joining us. So now, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our special guest, the one and only Jennifer Stemple. Jennifer is a Los Angeles native and currently joining us from her kitchen in St. Louis. You may have seen her work featured by Women's Day, Rachel Ray Every Day, Pop Sugar, NBC Latino, PJ Library, The Nosher, MyJewishLearning.com, and many more sources. I personally have had the pleasure of enjoying her cooking demos and videos and recipes for many years. And I'm so excited that she could join us tonight. So hopefully you have had a chance to gather your ingredients and can cook along together. If not, maybe you're like me and you're going to learn, go shopping and then do the recipe this weekend. Either way, we are recording. And so we'll make sure that uh, you have the recording and the link to the recipe as well, which is now in the chat box. So the cubanruben.com, that link is there. So Jennifer, please take it away. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Kayla, sorry. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with you all this evening. And that's right, I'm coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, although I wish I were there with you in your kitchen. Um, but it's as if I am. Today, we are going to be making one of my personal favorite recipes. And um, it has a very special connection with my family through many, many years. Um, but they are called in Spanish, they are called pastelitos de guayaba y queso. Um, and in English, that, that translates to guava and cheese pastry. Now, there is a bakery in Los Angeles that is one of my favorite bakeries in all of the land. Um, it's owned, by, and owned and run by a Cuban family, and it's called Portos. At Portos... They have coined this very famous pastry as refugiados, which translates to refugees. Now, they have, they probably have their, their reasons for calling it refugees, but in my opinion, my guess is that they call it refugees because it's a little taste of home. This recipe is not typically one that you will find in Cuba. It's very much a Cuban American dish um, but the combination of guava and cheese is a very typical Cuban flavor, a Cuban match in, in you know, ingredients. So um, you might find it called a guava and cheese pastry or pastelito, um, but only a portos will you find it as refugiados. But that's what my family calls it because we first had them at portos. But let's make them together today. These are kind of like the, the Cuban sweet baraka recipe. And um, it starts with some puff pastry that's been thawed. And you find puff pastry typically in the freezer department in your grocery store. It's not where like the cookie doughs and things like that are in the refrigerated section. They're in the freezer section. 
So they do need to thaw, but what makes puff pastry so puffy and flaky and frankly delicious is that in the dough, you won't really see it with pre prepared puff pastry, but in the dough are little pockets of um, a fat, usually butter or vegetable oil, that type of thing. And as the puff pastry cooks, those pockets of fat create air pockets and that's what makes it so fluffy and delicious. So we are going to make six refugiados today. And you'll see that the puff pastry, when you unfold it, when it's thawed, it creates three very clear rows. That's really good. And we're gonna use that to our advantage. I'm gonna use my pizza roller and I am going to just cut it in half and then cut it into thirds. Now, um, typically when you're dealing with doughs and pastries and whatnot, um, you want to flour your board before you put the doughs on the board. Um, I didn't this time because this is pretty, it's not really sticking, but if you need to flour your board, flour it with a little bit of uh, powdered sugar rather than flour, because this is a sweet recipe and we can use all the extra sweetness that we can get. So the first six cutouts of puff pastry, these are gonna be the bottom pieces of our refugiados, of our guava and cheese pastries. So I'm gonna put these on a parchment lined baking sheet that's off to my side over here. And if you haven't already, this would be a good time to preheat your oven to 400 degrees. I've already done that because I'm just ready and excited to be here with you. So the next step is I'm going to unfold the next sheet. Usually puff pastry comes in a packet of uh, two sheets. And I'm going to just very gently roll this out because I want it to be a little bit bigger than the first sheet, mostly because these are going to be the tops to our barracas, to our guava and cheese pastries. So I want them to be just a little bit bigger since we have to count for the filling. Okay, so I rolled it out just a bit, but I'm gonna use the same technique. I'm gonna cut it in half and now I have six. Now, these are the tops. However, I need to score them. I need to make little pockets for the uh, air to come out from the filling so that our brekkas are not soggy. So there are several ways to do this. You can either uh, make it a streusel form, which is my favorite, in which case you will score it with three or four lines in the middle, but not going all the way to the end. So you'll see I started here and I ended here. So it doesn't go all the way to the end, but you can see that it's cut all the way through. You can also fill it um, like a triangle and then score the top, but I'm gonna make these streusel style since that's my favorite way to do it. And I'm just gonna score just a few times on each. This also is visually beautiful because um, the puff pastry sort of forms around the filling and you'll see um, just, it creates a beautiful curve really. Okay, so now I've scored my tops and I'm going to set these aside while I get the filling ready. So Jenny, I wonder if there's any baking time difference if you chose to do a triangle versus the rectangle. So there could be because um, you have a different amount of puff, puff pastry on your board or, or in your pastry, I should say. Um, but if that's the case, if you did choose to do a different shape, I would just watch it um, I would bake it for, if, if a recipe has a window of time, like, you know, bake for 10 to 15 minutes or until golden brown, you always set your timer for the first time number and then you check it. 
Um, so I, if you were doing a different shape than what I am walking you through today, then I would um, check your pastries at the earliest time point in the recipe. Right. Okay. So next, we are going to add the filling, the guava and cheese, or guayaba y queso in español, for those who are watching who are bilingual. Um, and it's really simple. It's just my favorite Philadelphia cream cheese. You can use any cream cheese brand you like. Um, and guava paste. Now, guava paste comes in a variety of brands, and each brand, and even within the same brand, it can look a little bit different. So, for example, this one's a Goya brand, and it's a block, and this one is also a Goya brand, but it's a tin. Um, rest assured, it's the same thing. It's just a packaging difference. Um, and even if you use a different brand, all you're looking for is a product that's called guava paste. So it needs to be in this form. Um, it can be the tin, it can be the block, it can be any brand you want, but it needs to be guava paste, not preserves, not jello, not whatever. Um, it has to be guava paste for it to work. The reason is, if you use a different product like a guava preserves or jam, it runs and it doesn't hold its form. It doesn't hold its shape in the pastry. So that's why you want this product for this recipe. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is I'm going to cut six pieces of cream cheese for our pastries. One, two, three, four, five, and six. All right. And we are going to just lay it in the middle of the pastry, making sure that you leave a border. You don't want to take it all the way to the edge, but you're going to kind of flatten this part out because the guava, as you might have guessed, is going right on top. So I'm just, I'm pushing that cheese in. Again, I'm leaving a border. You don't want to take it all the way to the end because you want to give it a chance and a space for the little tops to um, adhere. But you get the idea. I'm putting my cheese down right in the middle and I'm pressing it down. You can do the filling any order you like. Some people like the cheese on top. I kind of like the guava on top because then as the uh, scoring in the tops puffs up, you get little peaks of the red guava, which I like. So, all right, we're gonna do the same thing with the guava paste. And I'm really just doing like a heaping tablespoon for each. I'm, I'm as guesstimating with this. It doesn't, this part doesn't have to be exact, but you will see, I'm, I'm putting equal parts cream cheese to guava, that is the important part. And I'm just laying it right on top. So Jenny, I'm curious, for those of us who are less familiar with guava, could you describe sort of the flavor profile? Yeah, so guava is, I think, an acquired taste. Um, it's fortunately for me, a taste I acquired at a very young age because I had it so much. Um, but some people, I'm often told that it tastes as if strawberry and pineapple got together and had a, a fruit okay. baby. <laughs> okay. So that um, brings me up to a question I wanted to ask you. Um, I just would love to hear a little bit while you're working about your experience with food growing up, sort of who your influences were and if you by any means, we're a picky eater. I, I speak as the mother of a picky four and a half year old. Um, well, I do a lot of work with uh, families, with young children, and I'm very familiar with the picky eaters. Um, I too have picky eaters and I cook for a living. So it's pretty typical for kids to have uh, very strong food preferences and that's that's okay. Sometimes they grow out of them, sometimes they don't. Um, but I did, I grew up in the kitchen, which is why I think my 
palette might be more expanded than some. And I think that that is part of how um, you handle picky eaters um, and even eaters that are not picky. I'm a big advocate for getting children involved in food prep, getting them involved in the kitchen. I just, I really think that if a child is involved in the prep, they're more likely to try it. And that's exactly what happened to me. It's where I learned to eat so many different things. It's where I learned to cook so many different things. I was, I grew up in the kitchen with the matriarchs in my family, with my abuelita, with my tias, my aunts, my grandma. Um, and even, even some of the men were in there as well. Although traditionally, um, in, in Latin and Cuban culture, cooking is known or thought of as uh, a woman's role. But I think that that is changing now and that it really, anyone um, who wants to can just cook their hearts out. So um, I am at this point adding the tops back to my pastries and you can see, you can sort of help force that too. Um, the scores that we made in the tops are going to lay right around and your filling is going to peek out. That's a good thing. That's what you want. And so I'm just adding each top um, and I'm pushing down to make sure that it's really sticking to the bottom. If you want to reinforce that, you can sort of, uh, let's see if I can move this back. You can run your finger around the border with a little bit of water and it'll really make it stick. So that's another trick there. This is, I'm not having a problem over here. So that's not an issue. Um, in fact, my dough is actually getting a little too warm. And if that happens to you, no sweat, just finish the assembly and once you're done, pop it in the fridge to cool off some before you um, put it in the oven. Because you don't want mushy, soggy pastries, you want fluffy and delicious pastries. So, hold on, we're having some technical stuff happening on my end. Anything I can help you with? Okay, we're back. Okay, so. Um, I am going to make these a little pretty because I think we eat with our eyes first. And I'm using a fork just to crimp the edges. This also will make sure that they're really sealed nice and tight. I'm just pushing very gently. Um, this is a great job if you're cooking with little ones. Um, my kids love doing this step. And I always say when you're cooking with little ones, I know a lot of people get discouraged because oftentimes it makes a big mess and it slows things down quite a bit in the kitchen. But if you've got the time, just know that messes clean up and you're not just making messes, you're making memories. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember and um, food plays a huge role in memory, as does smell. Mm -hmm. So having your kids in the kitchen with you, doing this or doing whatever it is you're, you're cooking or baking, um, it's such a great gift that you can give them. It's a sensory experience. It's you're, They're learning a life skill. Um, and kids can be in the kitchen from the moment that they are old enough to engage with an adult, like even before they're standing. Um, my kids, I had them sitting on the kitchen floor and we didn't use teethers. My kids teethed on my wooden spoons. Uh -huh. um, they loved them because um, they were quite flavorful after all the cooking I've been doing. And, you know, they would just sit on the floor and, and watch me do my thing. And as they grew, um, you know, by the time they were really 18 months old, um, they were cooking with me. They were, if they were old enough to stand, they were with me cooking. I love that. I love the, uh, 
so many people I know have those kitchen helper stools for the kitchens. My daughter just lives on the, the kitchen counter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you got to keep them safe. But, right, right, right. Um, I had, I have the, I think it's called the learning tower. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but that's what we use, but you can use, it's a glorified step stool. Right. You know, turn your chair backwards and have them stand on that. Just make sure that they're secure. But yeah. Okay. Next step, I have all my pastries sealed and I am going to put on what I like to call baking suntan lotion. This is what makes them golden and shiny and just delicious. This is simply a whisked egg. I'm going to do an egg wash on the top. And I'm making sure to really coat them. I don't want to miss any spots on here. This is also a great job for little hands. Um, my youngest, she now has more advanced responsibilities in the kitchen. But when she was younger, she's four now, she used to call this um, painting the dish. She does this still with my weekly challahs. Um, and you know, you just take your pastry brush and you run it along with your egg wash. This is the same thing that makes your challah beautiful and golden. That's what's gonna make this one beautiful and golden. So yeah, so you know, I grew up in the kitchen with the matriarch. That's where I learned to cook, and it's it's a very important tradition in my family that it's really it's a gift that I'm passing on to my kids as well. And, um, you know, there's no, there's no recipe that they really can't help me with, whether it's just stirring or um, adding, measuring things and adding spices or whatever it is, um, they're in there. I like to think that I'm, I'm creating good spouses. <laughs> I love it. I am. Um, that actually reminds me of the story that you tell on your website about giving your mom the empty binder and then having her at your wedding, giving you a, a binder filled with family recipes. I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that and sort of um, maybe a little bit of the inspiration of where this particular recipe came from and if that was included in the binder or a little bit more on that story. Yeah, so um, when I was younger, I think I, I think I might have been in college at the time. Um, I very selfishly gifted my mom an empty cookbook. <laughs> and, it, and in the cookbook I had inscribed, Dear Mom, this is a temporary gift. Your job is to fill it with our family's recipes and give it back when I get married. I was thinking I was I would be married and long, long, long time from there. So that would give her plenty of time to fill it up. Well, uh, I had long forgotten about this gift. And at my bridal shower, my mom presented me with the cookbook, but this time it had been filled with recipes, not just from my side of the family, but from my husband's as well. So there were recipes in there from my aunts and cousins and family that, that hadn't even immigrated to the States, family that was still in Cuba. Um, so it really, it was a really touching gift and it was a way for these recipes, <laughs> hi Jacob, that's my son, um, to, to um, hi sweetie, can I help you with something? We're in the middle of something, you need to not be in here, my love. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a lovely gift and it was just a really great way to, to honor that family history um, as this culinary history. Um, and it was also a great way to introduce me to the flavors of my husband's history, which is very different from mine. So the book itself has Latin flavors, of course, but also very Ashkenazi and Eastern European flavors in there as well. So it's a it's a true testament to this family that we have. Um, all right, so let's move forward here. Yeah. And the next step here is I'm going to sprinkle this with coarse sugar or turbinado sugar. This just adds a lovely crunchy bite at the end. 
It's a textural thing. It doesn't really need more sweetness at this point, but you know, I like the, the nice crunch of a little coarse sugar. So we're gonna add this. And then, as I said before, at this point, my dough has gotten a little soft. So I highly, if this has happened to you, I highly recommend just popping these into the refrigerator for 15 minutes and then putting them in the oven. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna pop them in the oven now. Right over here, I've already preheated to 400 degrees. Okay. And those are gonna bake at 400 degrees for 20 to 25 minutes until you see them get really nice and golden. Now I made earlier today, I made mini refugiados. You can do that as well. Instead of cutting your dough into six barracas, um, you can do twice as many. I made 12 here. And this is what they look like when they're done. You can see how- Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, you can see how scoring the dough really separates it like that. And the air comes out. And now you can see why I like to put the guava on top of the cheese because you get that little kiss of red. And um, you really know what's in there. But they are just, they're fluffy, they're flaky, they're crunchy from the sugar, they're sweet, a little bit of savory with that cream cheese. But cream cheese, I think, really lends itself well to a sweet pairing. Um, some people sweeten the cream cheese, but frankly, I don't think it needs it because the guava paste is already so sweet. So I'm going to enjoy one of these. Mm. I'm telling you, it takes me back to my youth, to going to Porto's bakery. Mm. We need to drive by your house and get one. <laughs> you can take it. I know. So I'm curious when you, what sort of events might you make these for and like how long they stay fresh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you so, have a chance, of course, but I'm very jealous of what you're enjoying right now. Um, you know, it really depends on the family. To be honest, um, my family was not very discerning about when we served these because we loved them so much. Um, they were not simply a breakfast item like, say, a strudel might be or a Danish might be. So we would serve these at any opportunity we ever got, um, whether it's a party or you're having um, a special visitor or um you know, you're, you're hosting a brunch would be a great opportunity to make these, but you can make, you can eat them for dessert, for breakfast, for a snack, whatever it is. There's no wrong time or wrong way to eat them. Um, but I think traditionally, as traditional as um, an immigrant recipe can be, um, this is my youngest, hello. Um, <laughs> um, as traditional as, as, as an immigrant recipe can be, hi, husband. <laughs> um, I think that they would typically be eaten as a snack or as a special treat. Um, but yeah, so we ate them all the time. Any, well, I should say any chance we got to go to the bakery and get some, or we would just make them. You know, you, you see how easy they are to make. Um, and, you know, if, we liked, if we needed to have them in bulk for a party or something like that, we would most definitely just go to the bakery and get them. But if it was just us or just a few extra visitors, we would definitely make them. Yeah. I love that. I'm curious if anyone who's joined us has any questions for Jenny. I'll give it a second. Somebody sent a message. Nope. Yeah, these are, you know, I've seen, I've especially in Miami where there's a, a very dense Cuban immigrant population, I have seen pastelitos with just guava without the cheese. Um, those are also really delicious. However, I like the combination of the guava and the cheese. I just think it's a much more traditional 
Cuban combination, Cuban pairing. Um, guava and cheese is just a very typical Cuban dessert. And so um, I like it together in the pastries. And it looks amazing. Okay, so if no one else has any questions, um, then I will go ahead and wrap us up. And Jenny, I am so appreciative of you sharing some of your family history and this beautiful recipe with us. I am, I'm also very sad that you're not here with us in person so we can enjoy the scents and the flavors and all of those things as well. Um, yeah, next time. But everybody who's here, if you want to just take a moment to think and maybe share one thought or idea or feeling you have after this experience, we would love to hear it. Um, and don't forget, I you already have the um, recipe link, but we'll send another email with that link out to make sure that you're able to enjoy that. Um, and I hope that you plan to join us and bring a friend for our upcoming events in this series. Next Thursday evening, we have author and cultural anthropologist Ruth Bayer joining us in person at the JCC. She's going to share her book, Tia Fortuna's New Home, and we will enjoy a kosher dairy dinner. We have a fun craft plan as well. Um, the following Sunday afternoon on the 22nd, we have another PG Library musician and author, Sarah Arowesti, whose music we heard at the top. She'll be here in person for Ladino Stories and Songs. And we are dropping the link in the chat box to sign up for those events. And please also make sure to check out Jennifer's website for more recipes at the Cuban Reuben. Um, and again, you have that link. I think, uh, Derek, if you're able to share that link one more time as well. But thank you all so much for a wonderful evening slash afternoon together. I'm going to jump in as well, Kayla. Um, you can find more information about me generally um, at jenniferstemple.com. Okay. Um, there are recipes as well. And I saw a question in the chat box and I'm just gonna yeah. address it before I pop off. Eggs or dates? No, um, if we can use cooked figs or dates that are well drained, we should um, You know, Susan, that's a very good question. I haven't used dried fruit before my suspicion my suspicion is um that there may not actually be enough moisture in there for this to work properly what i would recommend um conversely to that is using the paste of a different fruit if, if you can't find guava paste i know that quince paste is also um pretty readily available in in cheese counters in your normal grocery store um, you can go for that, but any fruit paste works great for this recipe. Awesome. I hope that's a question. And uh, remember, jenniferstemple.com is where you can reach me. And and oh yes, the one thing that I love to tell everyone who goes to any of my workshops or watches my videos, the absolute best part of my job is when I get pictures from people who have made the recipes that they have learned with us. So please send your pictures my way. It is, it absolutely tickles my heart. It makes me so happy. And it doesn't matter if they turn out looking exactly like I made them in this class, or if they turn out looking exactly like you made them at your house. Um, I really think that uh, it's just, it's my favorite part of the job. And really, if you're, and cheese pastries if your Cuban barracas don't look exactly like mine just remember this part um, I always say that when you are baking and when you're cooking something for others that you've made at home yourself um, I think it's okay that they look slightly imperfect because I think that that's that's when people know that you've made this with your heart, that you didn't go to Porto's bakeries and buy them um, for your friends to enjoy, that you made them, that you gave them this gift of nourishment and love. And so I think it's okay if they look different and um, go with your heart, do it, do it any way you like. So thank you for joining us today. And I hope uh, if you have any more questions, you know where to reach me. And uh, thanks so much, everyone. This is a lot of fun.
Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, everyone, we will share out the recording and links soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here. Take care. Bye-bye.